Hello everyone, and welcome back to another lecture video. In this lecture video, we're going to determine some stress measures. So recall that in the last lecture, we discussed the Cauchy stress tensor. So we have this nice three by three stress tensor. And now we're going to discuss some measures that we can obtain using that Cauchy stress tensor. The first one we're going to talk about is the hydrostatic stress tensor. The hydrostatic stress denoted as a lowercase p is a scalar representing the average normal stresses on the face of an infinitesimal cube. Therefore, if I have a nice Cauchy stress matrix, which is three by three, I can find that average of the hydrostatic stress by simply adding up the three diagonal components and then dividing it by three. So it's just an average of sigma one one, sigma two two, as well as sigma three three. Now, if we look at this and go, wait a second, if I'm adding up all the diagonal components, well, that's actually just the trace of the Cauchy stress tensor, and that's completely correct. So the hydrostatic stress can be taken as the trace of the Cauchy stress tensor and then divided by three. Now, people usually look at that trace and get so caught up with the trace that they forget to divide by three. So when you guys are doing your calculations, after you guys take the trace, make sure you guys divide by three. It's a mistake that I often always do, and I can imagine some of you may do as well. Now, something special about this is recall that the trace of a tensor is invariant. This means that no matter what basis, basis set is selected, this trace will never change. Therefore, we can calculate this hydrostatic stress from either a non-diagonal stress tensor, so the original stress tensor, or we can calculate directly from the principal stress tensor or the diagonal stress tensor. The answer will be the same no matter what you pick. Now, this hydrostatic stress P is just a scalar value, but if the question asks you for a hydrostatic stress tensor, all we need to do is take that value of hydrostatic stress P and multiply it by the identity matrix I. So what we'll get is a diagonal matrix with the diagonal components simply being a value P and the rest will be zero. So when it comes to the first stress measure here, it's actually pretty simple. Now the second one is the deviatoric stress sensor. And this one, pretty simple, but very, very useful. So the deviatoric stress tensor S is obtained by subtracting the hydrostatic stress tensor from the stress tensor. So when we're determining this deviatoric stress tensor, we're going to already need to determine what our hydrostatic stress tensor is. So we can represent this in a formula form by S, which is our deviatoric stress tensor, is equal to sigma, which is our Cauchy stress tensor, minus PI, which I said is the hydrostatic stress tensor in the slide before. Therefore, all we do is we take our Cauchy stress tensor, subtract our hydrostatic stress tensor, and we get the following stress tensor, where our deviatoric stress tensor is simply our Cauchy stress tensor, just with the hydrostatic stress subtracted from all of the diagonal components. Now, if we were to look at this one, it has a very unique property, and that is the first invariant of this deviatoric stress tensor, which is the trace of the stress tensor, it's actually equal to zero. So some of you guys might ask, well, what is the significance of this hydrostatic and deviatoric stress tensor? Well, the hydrostatic stress tensor is responsible for changing the volume of the body. Remember, if we were to look at that specific matrix, a diagonal matrix full of those components, we said that's related to simple contraction or expansion. Now, the deviatoric stress tensor, on the other hand, is responsible for changing the shape of the material while keeping the volume constant, or another word for this is the shearing of the material. Now, it may seem very trivial now, but this deviatoric stress tensor, I don't know why I can't say that very well, but it's going to be extremely important when we discuss the behavior of materials after yielding occurs, or in other words, plasticity. When we start talking about plasticity material models, this deviatoric stress tensor is going to come up everywhere, so be ready for it. All right, so those were uh, tensor. So every time that we calculate the hydrogen, hydrostatic stress tensor or the deviatoric stress tensor, we're given a tensor. So the next stress measure we're going to look at is the von Mises stress, which is perhaps one of the most important stress measures you guys can take away from this lesson. Now, what exactly is it? Well, I find it's best to show with a little example. Let's go back to our old friend, Mr. Potato, and we're going to take this potato into the structural lab, and we are going to subject it to some uniaxial tension. Now, what's nice about this is we can measure the stresses and the strains, and we can get a good material model for this potato. As we can see, it goes up nice and linear, and then at a certain point, it changes the slope and has a second, uh, secondary behavior. Now, what we're taking away from this is we can see that at a certain value of stress, which we're going to call the yield stress, this potato changes behavior. Now, because of this yield stress, we can easily figure out 
when this change occurs. If the seal stress is 400 MPa, and I were to give you guys a quiz question and say, this potato is subjected to 600 MPa, does it yield? Well, we know that 600 is greater than 400, so yes, it does yield. And if I give you, let's say, 300 MPa, you guys know that that's below the yield limit, therefore it has not yielded at that particular point. So it's very easy to tell in a uniaxial case what's going on. However, if I give you guys that material curve and then give you guys the potato in a triaxial state where we have six different stress components, well, it's very, very difficult to determine if the potato has indeed yielded. So the summary here is it's easy to see when the potato will yield in a uniaxial case. However, in a 3D case with the Cauchy state of stress, it becomes a little bit more difficult. Now, a solution to try and figure out if something has yielded in a 3D stress state is the von Mises stress measure. So it's based upon the Cauchy stress and it provides an equivalent uniaxial stress. Clayton, what exactly does this mean? Well, let's go into the calculations and take a peek. So the von Mises stress is actually a function of the second invariant of the deviatoric stress tensor. And you guys are thinking second invariant. We never use the second invariant. Well, this is a time where we actually use that second invariant. So sigma VM or sigma von Mises is equal to the square root of negative three multiplied by the second invariant of the deviatoric stress tensor. Now the key here, deviatoric stress tensor. We're not dealing with the Cauchy stress tensor right now. We're dealing with the deviatoric. Now, if we look at that second invariant, well, we know what that is. It's simply one half of the first invariant of S minus the first invariant of SS. We say, all right, well, hold on one second. We said that the first invariant of S, which is the trace of S, was equal to zero. So this actually becomes a lot more simple. And the von Mises stress is equal to three over two uh, multiplied by the first invariant of SS. So we can actually simplify this even more into more of a component form. And we say, all right, well, it's it's simplified, but it looks pretty gross. I don't want to have to deal with that. And I don't blame you guys. No one wants to deal with that. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the formula above and rearrange it to be expressed in terms of the Cauchy stress tensor components rather than the deviatoric stress tensor components. Therefore, I can calculate my von Mises stress as simply the square root of sigma 1, 1 minus sigma 2, 2 squared plus sigma 2, 2 minus sigma 3, 3 squared plus sigma 1, 1 minus sigma 3, 3 squared plus six times sigma one two squared plus sigma one three squared plus sigma two three squared all divided by two. So it's a real mouthful. It's not a lot of fun to say, but in the end of the day, if I were to give you guys a Cauchy stress tensor, you guys have everything you guys need to know to fill out whatever this von Mises stress is. Now, remember this calculated von Mises stress can be compared to the uniaxial yield stress. So therefore, if I were to give you guys a 3D state of stress represented by a Cauchy stress tensor, what I can do is say, will this uh, material yield under these 3D stresses if the yield strength is 400? Well, all you guys have to do is substitute in the Cauchy stress tensor to find your von Mises stress and then compare your von Mises stress to the yield stress. So if I get my von Mises stress as, let's say, 600 MPa and the yield stress is 400 MPa, then yes, it does yield under that triaxial state of stress. Or vice versa, if my yield stress is less than my von Mises stress is less than the yield stress, we can say that it does not yield. And this is just one of the many different yield criteria that you guys can use. There's actually a second one called the maximum shear stress, or sometimes people call it the Tresca criterion, but we're just going to keep it as maximum shear stress because it'll be very simple to memorize after you guys see the formulas. So as I said, another stress measure is the maximum shear stress. And as you guys can guess, well, the maximum shear stress is just going to be the maximum shear stress. So tau max is actually equal to the max of the difference between the principal stresses divided by two. Now, if we look at that, we say, hold on a second. What did you say, Clayton? Yes, I said it correctly. We are dealing with the principal stresses. So if we're using this yield criterion, the first thing that we have to do with our Cauchy stress tensor is actually find the eigenvalues or those principal stresses because that's what we're going to use in this particular formula. Now, we look at that formula and say, all right, well, the principal stresses, it's very simple. I just find the difference between all three of them, and then I divide it by two, and whatever one is the maximum, well, that's going to be my maximum shear stress. Well, we look at that and say, it seems like a very simplistic formula. How exactly did you get it? Or why is this even the case? Why do we deal with principal stresses that don't have shear when we're talking about shear? 
Well, it comes down to this. If I have the principal stresses represented here, I know that I can rotate my state of stresses to obtain different state of stresses. Remember, it's just a transformation. So if I were to rotate it by 45 degrees, well, then my stress tensor becomes something like this. And as we can see, we start to develop shear stresses. Now, if I rotate it 45 more degrees, I can see that I'm back in line with the original eigenvalues because they form an orthonormal basis set and there's no more shear stresses. So from this, we can conclude that the shear stresses are going to occur between a value of zero and 90 degrees. At particular, we know it's going to be 45 degrees, but why is it 45 degrees? Well, let's take a closer look. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, all right, which angle produces those maximum shear stresses? Again, we already know that it's going to be 45 degrees, but let's try and prove it. So let's say that we have a principal stress tensor, sigma, which is sigma 1, 0, and 0, sigma 2. So sigma 1 and sigma 2 there, those are two principal stresses. And we want to rotate this stress tensor by a counterclockwise rotation matrix of Q. So that uh, counterclockwise rotation matrix, you guys have seen that before. You guys know where it comes from. At this point, it shouldn't be uh, anything too scary. Now, sigma prime, which is going to be the transformation of the stress tensor after the rotation matrix, can be found as Q, Q transpose, and we get the following components. Now, remember, we're interested in where is the maximum shear. And these shear stress components are going to be those two diagonal components, which in this case right now are sigma 2, sigma 1, multiplied by theta multiplied by cosine theta. Remember, we want to find out which angle of theta produces the maximum shear stress. How do we do that? Well, all we need to do is take the function of the shear stress, take the derivative, and make it equal to zero. Remember the uh, calculus concepts of minimums, maximums, stuff like that? That's all we're doing here. So since we have that nice expression for sigma 1, 2, all I need to do is take the derivative of it and make it equal to zero. Therefore, I get cosine squared of theta is equal to sine squared of theta. Now, if I'm looking in the realm between 0 and 90 degrees, the only solution for this is theta is equal to 45 degrees. I sub this back into my equation. I see that the maximum shear stress uh, for this particular case, when we have uh, the principal stresses sigma 1 and sigma 2, is going to be sigma 2 minus sigma 1 multiplied by sine 45 multiplied by cosine 45. What is this simplified to? Well, it's the difference between the two stresses all divided by 2. And again, this is for a 2D case. If you guys have a 3D case, remember, you have to check the difference between all three of the different principal stresses. But that's basically it. We can repeat the same process for sigma 1, 3 and sigma 2, 3. Nice and easy. So that's really it for this video. Hopefully it was a little bit quicker than the other videos. I know some of them can get pretty beefy at times, but uh, I just want to thank you guys for being troopers through it all. All right, guys, that's it for stress measures. I will see you guys in the next lecture video when we talk about balance equations. All right, guys, thank you guys so much for listening. I'll see you guys in the next lecture video.